Church on this August 11th. It's a great day to be outside, but it's also a great day to be here in the house of the Lord. We really appreciate those of you that are here worshiping in person with us today, and those of you also that are joining on live stream, we appreciate that as well. And those of you that will join us later on on YouTube, we're glad that you're here to worship at Old North United Methodist Church. My name is Kim Salmon. I have a few announcements for you as a worship chair here. Um, some of them are included in this month's lantern. Uh, if you haven't picked up a copy of it, it there is uh, one at the Welcome Center. Uh, however, there are some other announcements as well. The Intentional Faith Development will meet at 11 a.m. in the upper room and also on Zoom. Uh, They're doing this study uh, by Adam Hamilton called Wrestling with Doubt and Finding Faith. An excellent opportunity for you to have a discussion about your doubt and your faith. Thursday Night Bible Study continues their study on um, the book of Acts. We have a shared meal. We'd love for you to bring a dish or two. And we meet from 5.45 to 7 o'clock. We are also in the upper room and do have Zoom invitation available for those of you that would like to study at home. I uh, do want to share with you that the United Methodist men are still collecting scrap metal. If you're interested in you have a donation, see Bruce Wright. The United uh, Women of Faith will have their meeting uh, this Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the upper room. You won't want to miss that. We'll be planning some of our fall dates like uh, Artisan Fair and our uh, cheese ball sale. I do also want to remind you that those of you that have been anticipating and waiting to sign up for Fall Festival and Mount, uh, Mount Vernon River Days, those signups will be downstairs and will be downstairs every week, every Sunday, until those uh, until those uh, festivals begin. Again, Mount Vernon River Days are September 13th and 14th. That's a Friday and a Saturday. That's like tomorrow. So don't blink because it'll be here before you know it. And then, of course, Fall Festival is October 7th through the 12th. That is a Monday through Saturday. Um, sign up once, sign up twice, sign up many, many times because we need your help. It's such a big fundraiser for our church. Our preschool is uh, beginning soon. Their first day of school is August 27th, and they're asking to have some people from our church to help and assist uh, on that first day of school. They're also asking from 8.15 to 12 o'clock for uh, people from our church to assist with preschool orientation and that's the 20th and the 22nd. That's not this week, it's next week. So we're, we're still looking uh, for one more prayer partner at preschool, so if you've had that on your heart and you would like to uh, help out, maybe this is the year for you to start. Um, I do want to also remind you that uh, those of you that are in Sunday school, uh, the time is approaching for the pool party on August 25th. If you have read all five of those books, uh, from uh, the June classes. If you haven't, there is a checklist and you can pick up those books and get those books read so that you can come and have fun in the pool on August the 25th. Our Stringtown Reading Buddies will be starting up soon. We haven't heard when we are to begin yet, but if you're interested, there's always a place at Stringtown. They they implore our help and those kids really enjoy our help. So please consider that as well. Other opportunities to volunteer here at Old North United Methodist Church. We need Sunday school teachers, people to usher, those that would like to sponsor altar flowers to be communion stewards. You know, we've, uh, we've lost somebody on our worship team because she got married and moved away. We miss you, Callan, but we need somebody to fill Callan's space if you'd like to work on the worship team and do the soundboard, we'd love to have you. Uh, we are also in need of people to do uh, children's moments and read scripture. Again, I made the comment about Fall Festival and our Mount Vernon River Days. If you were outside and didn't hear, those signups will be downstairs 
for those two events that are very important to our church. And I have one last um, announcement before I sit down and begin to worship. Um, we are having a, a meeting after this worship service, and we invite you to be here in the sanctuary after worship. Lynn Pendlin will lead the meeting as we explore the opportunities that Dinner Church will offer to our church here at Old North. The meeting should be 15 to 20 minutes. You should be able to get to Sunday school or wherever you need to be, but we'd love to have you here as we uh, explore those opportunities of Dinner Church here at Old North United Methodist Church. Now it's time to worship God. Good morning, everyone. Please join with me in the call to worship on page 769 in your hymnal. We'll sing the first response. I'll, uh, Joe will play it. I'll try to sing it. And then we'll all sing together. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast to the Lord. Let the afflicted hear me and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt God's name. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to God and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. The poor cried out, and the Lord heard, and saved them out of all their troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. O oh, taste and see 
that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. Oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear God have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good things. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord, which is your desire's life, and come many days to enjoy good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The ears of the Lord hear their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them. The Lord keeps all their bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in God will be condemned. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. All right. Please stand as you are able and join me in singing the opening hymn, which is page 121, There is a Wilderness in God's Mercy. A wideness in God's mercy, I'm sorry. It's not wilderness, it's wideness. <laughs> Morning. It is a beautiful day. Beautiful. Are there joys or concerns to share with the family this morning? Ma'am.
There have been a lot of joys as our move, my husband's and my move to a new dwelling proceeds. But I want to especially talk about one that happened yesterday. Um, I met a woman a couple of doors down from us and a, another neighbor who were walking along and she said, uh, my name is Betty Miller. And, and I said to myself, that's Betty Giles. <laughs> and I said, you know, I knew a Betty at Old North who looks like you and talks like you. <laughs> and she said, that's me. <laughs> so we hugged each other. That was wonderful. Okay, the, the uh, Thursday morning women's group is returning now to our reading a book. So we meet at 9.30 starting now because we go by the EBSC calendar and school is back in session. That's all I have. I have a concern. Uh, Diane, Ar uh, Diane Arneson, she just spoke. <laughs> Diane Hobbs, our secretary, they've lost a very dear friend, uh, Mike Martin, uh, and she will be uh, gone on Monday for his funeral. Uh, please pray for not only Diane, but the Martin family as they deal with this death. Um, many of you know that this year has been a little difficult in the Bonenberger household. Rick's had two strokes. Uh, the first one he lost his peripheral vision of both eyes. The second stroke has taken away a short-term memory. And then this past Wednesday in the wee hours of the morning he fell again for the second time. Um, has hurt his knee and presently is at the Woodlands. Um, I don't know if this is a part-time or a permanent change in situation. We just take it day by day. So just, I ask for continued prayers. Well, let's gather our hearts and our souls together in prayer. Please join me in singing Kumbaya. Gracious and ever-loving God, we give you thanks on this beautiful morning. We'll give you thanks for the, the hope and the promise of cooler weather. We'll give you thanks for successful move and rejoining of friendships. What a joy it is to, to restore the, the flickering flame of, of friendship. We give you thanks for uh, all the love and, and the care that goes into healing medically. We ask for your blessing on those who struggle with health, with all those who love them, with the medical team that, that supports them. Lord, we also recognize that as much as we pray for healing, sometimes the healing comes through loss. We ask for your blessing on our sister Diane, 
on her family as she deals with the loss of a friend. Give her grace and peace and love and support. We ask for your blessing on our bishop in his time of transition <clears throat> and on our new bishop as she prepares to come to Indiana. We ask for your blessing on the cabinet, on the leaders of this church, all those who carry out the work of this congregation as we continue to shine a light of hope in this corner of the world. All these things we lift to you in the name of Jesus, who continues to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen please join me in singing the refrain to the spirit song loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak but he is strong yes Jesus loves me yes Jesus loves me yes Jesus loves me the Bible Good morning. Good morning. We had a little bit of a confusion on exchange of mics this morning. <laughs> Come here, kids. We're not going. We're, we're going to take a. We're going to take a walk today instead of sitting down. You know, I like to talk about these windows sometimes. And today we're going to talk about one of my 19 favorite windows in this room. Probably my favorite one is that one up there. We call that a rose window, and I'm not sure why we call it a rose window because it doesn't look much like a rose to me. But I like that one because of all the symbols that are in it. You know, you got the bread and the cup, reminds us of communion, and well, you just have a whole lot of symbols in there that, that remind us of different things. So that's probably my, my favorite window. But another one of my favorite windows is this one right here. I want you to take a look at that window. What? I still didn't hear you. It's got, what, do you, what can you tell us about that window? It has a lot of crowns on it. It has a lot of? What? Crowns. A lot of crowns. What else can you tell me about that window? Oh, surely you can see something in that window that's different from all the others. Who are the people in the window? Jesus and Mary and Joseph. <laughs> right? Okay, what else can you tell me about that window? Yeah. 
There's a star. Anything else? There's a treasure chest on it. There's a treasure chest on it. Wow, way up at the top, yeah. Do you see anything that is really different about that? Well, I'll, I'll give you a hint. I didn't see it either until a visitor was here a couple of weeks ago and pointed it out. There's something else about Look real carefully at that star at the bottom that has a cross in it. Maybe you need to get a little closer to it and you see what I'm talking about. Go up and look at that star. At that star. Do you notice anything in that star? A cross. Well, a cross, but what else? My goodness. That's it. Scratches. What about the glass? What's what's the what are those lines? Hmm? Cracks. What about the glass? Cracked. It's broke. It's cracked, isn't it? It's broken. You know, we could look at that window all day and not notice that it's broken. I was. I think it was two weeks ago, I was sitting right here. And I look at that window every Sunday. But a visitor looked at that, just glanced over it, and said, well, that window's broken. You know, that reminds me that sometimes we take things for granted and we think that everything is just fine. And we don't see that something's wrong or something's broken. It, it takes somebody else, somebody who doesn't look at it every Sunday, to point out to us that something is wrong. Now, since that window's broken, does that mean we have to take that whole window out and throw it away? No. No, there's an artist in town who can take just that part that has the star in it and replace it with another piece of yellow glass and even paint the black on it and make it ju look just like new. And that's kind of the way it is with us too. You know, sometimes we don't see the little things in the big picture that aren't exactly right. And sometimes we need just a little bit of a fix. We don't throw the whole thing away, we just have an artist come along and help us fix that little bitty thing that's wrong with us. And that artist is Jesus. Let's pray about it. Dear God, we sometimes miss the little things that aren't quite right. And we ask that you will help us fix them. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, and everybody says, Amen. The epistle reading this morning is Ephesians chapter 4, 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. So then putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for that we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. 
Rather, let them labor and work honestly for their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, not only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as be beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. say thanks for the things you have done for me, things so undeserved that you give to prove your love for me, the voices of a million angels do not express. My gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee, to God be the glory, to God be the glory. Absolutely amazing. At this time, I would invite the rest of our offerings.
preachers here below. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the many blessings you have poured out upon us. And we return a portion of those blessings back to you now for the further service of your church. Amen. You may uh, go ahead and be seated and then turn in your Faith We Sing hymn, though, the little black one, to page. 2171, and we're going to sing Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Our scripture reading this morning is some bits and pieces of chapter 18. And the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the purple, I'm sorry, all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders about Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. And Absalom chanced to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth. 
while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. And behold, the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Great tidings for the Lord the king, for, for my Lord the king, for the Lord has delivered you this day from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would that I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Here ends the reading of God's holy words. It's unfortunate that the story of Absalom's death has gotten broken up into little bits and pieces. This is a horribly rich story, and it's one of those stories that doesn't get enough airplay, I think. The Bible is stuffed to the brim with these rich and full stories like this that only get a tiny little bit of airtime. They come up once every three years in the, in the cycle. I read you little tiny bits and pieces of the story because it, it really is <clears throat> pretty long and involved. There's really quite a lot of background to the story. I don't usually name my sermons, but the title for this one might be Great Military Blunders or something like that. <clears throat> the background goes like this. David had a son named Amnon and a daughter named Tamar. Amnon raped his sister Tamar, but David didn't really do anything about it. So this other son, Absalom, decided he was going to take the law into his own hands. He had Amnon killed. And then when David's men came after Absalom, Absalom ran away. He lived here and there for a number of years, got married, had a family. And then finally he returned to Jerusalem, to the city of David. He started making a lot of friends, establishing himself politically. But the relationship with David was still sort of strained. David could see that Absalom was starting to become more popular than he was, which is something that can make a king sort of nervous. And the story goes on and on until eventually Absalom got together an army and started making a bid for the throne. And that's about where we come in this morning. David wanted to go out and make battle himself. But the people all said to him, no, you're a king now. Kings don't do battle. They have other people do that for them. Kings stay in the city and run things from there. So David sent out his armies. It says he set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. This is a very big deal. But he said to his generals, do what you need to do, but don't harm Absalom. Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom, he said. And then we come to the part about how Absalom was riding along on a mule and he got his head stuck in some low branches of a tree, but his mule just kept on walking. This is where I get that sermon title, Great Blunders in Military History, or whatever it was called. Actually, just about every aspect of this story seems to me to be a great blunder in military history. 
It wasn't even the generals who found Absalom stuck there in the tree. It was the guys carrying the armor. It was, it was the caddies. They came across this great man, the son of the king, the head guy, tangled up in a tree. And this must have looked to them like the chance of a lifetime. This was their big opportunity to make a name for themselves. These caddies killed Absalom. And then a man was sent back to Jerusalem to tell King David about the battle. A Cushite, it says, a stranger. Not even one of the king's own men, but a, a stranger. The Cushite ran and ran and ran and ran, and he finally got to the city, and he said to the king, Great news, king, you won. Actually, he said, The Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. And David said, What word of Absalom? What about Absalom? What, what happened to him? And of course, the Cushite didn't know any better. So he blurts out, even better, Absalom himself is dead. If only God would strike all your enemies as dead as this guy is, he says. Oh, my son. Oh, my son. It's easy to imagine that that horrible sinking feeling in David's chest when the man told him that Absalom had been killed. His son was dead. Oh, my son. No. He must have known this was going to happen one day. He must have had this in the back of his Mind is a natural part of the struggle for power, especially in the Middle East. We have become blinded to the fierce violence of politics in the United States because we've learned to handle the transition of power differently. But even today, the, the fierce violence that accompanies power struggles can be seen on the nightly news when there's a fight over control, people die. And other people celebrate those deaths. David had to have seen this coming. David had to have known that when battles are fought, people die. But no matter how prepared we think we are for the inevitable, no matter how much we can rationalize death, no matter how often we repeat the mystery of faith, we're always, always, always caught off guard to learn of a loved one's death. What word of Absalom? He's okay, isn't he? Families are hardly ever like the Cleavers. On television and in movies, families are portrayed, portrayed as sugar-coated and warm and sweet, and it's certainly an ideal model for what each of us really wants. We want mom and dad to live together, and we want dad to come home from down at the office at 5 o'clock, and we want mom to have supper on the table at 6 o'clock sharp. We want Wally and the beef cracking jokes at the dinner table, and we want our problems to be solved in half an hour. Families are hardly ever like this. A lot of families are a whole lot more like David's family. A lot of families have loud and violent conflict. A lot of families have struggles over power and money and infidelity and crime and rage. A lot of families have learned that the most effective way to deal with these issues is to simply ignore them to hope that they will go away. A lot of families are a whole lot more like David's family than like the Cleavers. In my many years of chaplaincy and counseling and 
as I've gained more and more life experience, I've come to realize that a lot of families are a whole lot more like David's family than like the Cleavers. Uh, I've come to realize that that buzz phrase, family values, more and more includes violence and incest, includes money struggles, includes battles over power, includes parents who fight deep into the middle of the night, includes children who hate their parents. More and more I've come to realize that these are the families which are more prevalent in our lives than the values of sitcom television. David was a man who controlled generals and armies, who sat on the throne of a very powerful nation, who had the power to gather to himself the most beautiful woman in the known world. David was the first king over all 12 tribes of Israel. Even now, people in Israel think of David in terms of his greatness, of his vast wealth and power. Even now, the the blue symbol on the Israeli flag is the Star of David. When Jesus came into the world, he lived his entire life under the shadow of the great King David. For a lot of people, Jesus' authority is still validated by the lineage he shared with King David. And yet, for all his wealth and power, David was a man whose family was coming apart at the seams. One son raped his sister. One son killed his brother. One son rose up in defiance of the father. Say what you will about family values. These are the family values we see all around us today. My own family has some of these biblical family values. My youngest son grew up calling another man daddy. And still David hoped against hope that something could be resolved in his family. Even in sending out his generals and his armies, even when it looked like there was no turning back from the battle, David had these words to say to his generals, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Do what you need to do, but deal gently with Absalom. No, okay, okay, okay. My family is in a shambles. But at least have the common decency to respect my son. David had already lost one son. And even though we can sit back smugly some 3,000 years later and say, well, that son deserved to die. That still doesn't address the pain that David must have felt. His family was falling apart. One son was dead. One son hated him. Be nice for crying out loud. Just stop messing up for once. Can we please just stop messing up so much? Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. A parent should never outlive their child. A father should never live long enough to bury his son. But there are fathers who have outlived sons. There are families that fall apart. There are fathers who argue deep into the night with mothers. There are families who hope it'll all just go away. There are families that fight over money and power and Rage, I can't help but feel compassion for David. What word of Absalom? Oh, even better, your highness, your honor, whatever your name is. Absalom himself is dead. If only God would strike all your enemies as dead as this guy is. We won. The enemy is dead. The war is over. Celebrate with us. We're winning. Family values in the 21st century. Oh, Absalom, my son. Oh, no, 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 no. Many years later, the tradition says, 
David wrote the Psalms. We read the Psalms so quickly in the beginning of each service, but listen to these words. I don't know if David wrote them or not. Some say he did, some say he didn't. I don't know. But just for this morning, we will pretend he did. We'll pretend that the ancient tradition is right and that these words were written by David. Many years later, after the battles were done, after life had gotten back to normal, after the adjustments had been made in his family, I like to picture David sitting on the back patio. He would be a much older man now. Solomon, his youngest son, had already been named the heir apparent. Solomon is the son of Bathsheba, his favorite wife. And again, even that is a story that doesn't get talked about out loud at the family reunions there in the palace. And Solomon seems to have what it takes to replace David. Already Solomon is old enough that the, the girls are starting to notice him, like, like Prince uh, Harry and, and the other one in England. I picture him, Prince Solomon. Let's pretend that David has gotten older and he's sitting on the back patio with a legal pad on his lap and a pencil stub between his teeth and he's looking at the sunset. I, I do this. I, I used to do this more. When I lived out west, I used to sit on the front steps sometimes and watch the sun setting over the mountains. And I would just think about stuff like David must have thought about stuff about his daughter about his sons about what could have been but what wasn't about his family and about what a mess he's made of his life and about what used to be so gentle and wonderful and what ended up being such a mess and I can picture David sitting there on the back patio watching the sunset with a legal pad on his lap and a bit up pencil stuck in his mouth. And I picture him staring and thinking and then writing this down. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be worshipped. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in the Lord's word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with the Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. We call it uh, Psalm 130. But of course when it was written it wasn't called that. It was some random thoughts written down on a legal pad. A picture of David writing that on his paper there on the back patio while he watched the sun setting over the mountains. And maybe I just picture that because that's what I've done. Maybe I feel a little bit like David sometimes. Out of the depths, I cry to thee, O Lord. A lot of my life is really messed up, I think. A lot of my life is a lot like David's, I think, sometimes. I thought I knew what family values meant until I got a family of my own, and I sometimes think I, I mess things up like David did. David's family was more like mine than I like to let on sometimes, and maybe that's why I picture him sitting out on the back patio, staring at the sun sitting over the mountains. Is it well with the young man Absalom? Are you kidding? We killed him, but good. We killed him like nobody's business. Sometimes families are pretty messed up, it seems. 
Family values are a tricky thing, I think. And you, you might be wondering, sitting there, wondering why I'm presenting such a, a cynical view of families in my sermon. You might be sitting there wondering why the preacher is talking about people who don't live perfect lives. And the reason is because most of us don't live perfect lives. Most of us live with biblical family values, ironically. A lot of people never come to church because they're afraid they're going to be found out. That the people in church are going to find out that their neighbors don't have perfect families. A lot of people feel embarrassed about how badly they've messed up their families, how badly they've lived out their lives, so they don't come to church. The reason I talk about stories in the Bible that have to do with dysfunctional families is because almost everyone's family is just a little bit dysfunctional. Our task in the church is not always to try and find the most perfect family in town. And it's not always to find the worst family in town. I say this almost every Sunday, so it should come as no surprise to you. I think our task in the church is to help you recognize your own story within the stories of our tribe. Sometimes our task in the church is to help people find a voice for their experiences. Sometimes our task is to walk with people through the valley. David's family was uh, like mine in a lot of ways. I have not lived the perfect life. So you see, it, it turns out I fit right in. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. Let's sing a song. I caught Joe off guard again. Please turn in your hymnals to page 474 and rise as you're able to sing with us, Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
just a reminder that there will be a, a brief meeting right after uh, the postlude uh, about uh, Fresh Expressions Ministry. Go forth now into your homes, into your workplaces, into all the places where you gather to proclaim and to be the love of God. May you continue to be created. May you continue to be redeemed. May you continue to be sustained and nourished and blessed and held and loved 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 by God Almighty. And may peace abide among you. Amen. <laughs>